Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lesson 17, Week 17. Incredible. We are almost done with Genesis 1 through 11. Um, so just a reminder, on May 24th is the last class. We will have certificates available for those that have participated and have been attending at least 90% of the time, whether online or here. And if you could, just let me know that you have been watching online Go back, let the girls know at registration so that we can make sure that you get a certificate. Um, and then tonight, we will be announcing the new class. Yes. Any guesses? Anyway. Um, so, yeah. So let me just pray and we'll get started. Pastor Tim will let you know. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your word, to learn to dwell in, Lord God, with you, or to delve in with you. Father, we thank you for this night, for um, Pastor Tim, and just his heart to teach us. And Father, we just want to say thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And Pastor Tim, thank you. Okay. The next class is starting June 14th. And it's going to be a seven-week class, so just for the summer. And we are going to study the letter from Jude. The letter from Jude. It's, yes, so I'm so excited about this because Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, writes this 25-verse letter. And those 25, so we're going to have seven weeks to really dive into 25 verses, which is so exciting. And some of these verses, you're like, what? He's saying, this happened, where is that in the Bible? Uh, and we're gonna explore where he, he gets the things that he talks about. Some of them are in the Bible and some of them are like, I don't remember reading that. So his situation is there's a crisis in the church. Some creeps are coming in. He calls them people that have crept in. So I'm calling them creeps. They're, they're coming into the church they're trying to redirect the teachings of Jesus and reformulate them to this agenda that they have. And he says, therefore, they're denying Jesus. And Jude has some very interesting things to say about the creeps. And then he gives a rather shocking way that he's advising to deal with them that totally redirects back to the teachings of Jesus. And it's just such a beautiful letter. I cannot wait to get into it. Like always, the class will be free and the materials will be free. Uh, we're making a little change because we need your help. If you want the materials digitally, we're going to provide them before the class instead of after the class. They'll continue to be free. But for the printed materials, we need your help. Uh, if you could please help us defray the printing expenses, which when we took a look at the printing expenses last year, you know, we swallowed hard and we're like, you know, I think people will, will help us. So you can actually um, help us out with $25 for the book and all the printed materials for whatever class it is, not just for the short class that we're doing, but that'll be for any class. Uh, including the 19-week classes. It's, it'll just be the same. And it just helps us to defray uh, the printing expenses and all the stuff that goes around that. It will also, it, now if you prefer not to have the printed stuff, you want to print it on your own or just do it digitally, totally cool. But if you really want to have this, then just help us with that if you would please. And if you would like, there might be people who are like, I just have to have this, but I don't have $25, so talk to Mariette. Maybe you can um, pay forward to some other folks as well. So let me just sign in here. It's that Wednesday sign out thing. All right. So I'm really excited about tonight because tonight we, we get to see how the biblical authors themselves take this information that we've learned from the flood story and they apply it to their own writings. So it gives us a chance to do like an interpretative clinic on some of the rest of the Bible. We're gonna be looking at several spots in the amazing scroll of Isaiah. 
we're going to be looking at uh, Peter's letter, especially 2 Peter. We're going to be looking at some of the words of Jesus in Matthew. And, but I want to start with a little bit of recap and just kind of setting our lens again. Because when you take most classes about the flood, the topic is going to be, okay, where's the scientific evidence and proof that we have to show all these skeptics uh, that, you know, and other evolutionary scientists and old earth people and whatnot that the flood is, a, is an actual real deal. And so, you know, looking for scientific evidence, um, providing archeological or rather geological evidence, scientific evidence for it. This is, this is what a lot of classes on the flood are about. And as you know, I've just taken a completely different approach. I've tried to see th things through the eyes of the ancient Israelites themselves. So, but with that in mind, I wanna go back a little bit and at least take a look at how we are gonna approach those subjects as believers who've studied Genesis 1 through 11. Because people are gonna ask, you know, well, you took this class, it was 19 weeks, give me all the scientific evidence that you, that you learned, and you're gonna be like, well, we didn't really talk about that. And folks are gonna say, well, what did you talk about? What else is there to talk about? And as you know, there are other things to talk about. But I want to at least address the debate. In this debate, there are a whole bunch of people who have planted the flag in that this uh, flood is a global deluge of water that covered the entire, what we know now as the globe of the earth and present all kinds of fascinating evidence for it. If you go online or if you uh, watch certain documentaries, you're gonna see some fantastic information that will be presented to you about that. And it will just, if, if you're in that camp, it's just gonna encourage you, you're gonna love it. Um, the, the little bit of a danger there is that what we don't want to do is say that, well, because we see this affirmed in our 21st century scientific approach and materialistic approach to things, and it's affirming, you know, and giving us comfort in what we think now, that therefore people who are of a different stripe, and they're not going to look at it that way, they're complete idiots, <laughs> And, you know, we should just completely reject them. They have no clue what the Bible is about. And that's not necessary. It's not necessary. Even though I may be of that stripe, I want to be careful not to close ears, especially when the biblical authors themselves are actually, they have a whole different lens and mindset. You'll have other people that are convinced that the whole thing is a myth. It's just a complete myth. Now, People mean different things by that. 99% of people, when they say that the flood story is a myth, what they're saying is it's false, that it's something to be debunked. This never really happened on a global scale, and therefore you can't trust anything that the Bible says. And then they have their piles of evidence that they present for that. Uh, there's a small percentage of people that, that have a classic definition of myth as a foundation story of a people, um, but very few people have that classic definition. That would be like a C.S. Lewis definition of myth. But there's that whole group there. And then there's folks that say, well, maybe there was something that happened. Maybe there was a big flood. I don't know. Maybe Euphrates River flooded. And they developed this hyperbole language that it just covered the whole earth. It was a local flood of some kind or a regional flood. Um, but, you know, the biblical account is just using big language to describe it. Maybe it kind of blew up out of proportion in people's minds. So you're going to find people in all, all those areas and they will have all sorts of arguments to back up their positions. And what I'm trying to present to you today is to the biblical authors that debate is secondary. It's very, in fact, I'm not even sure they would have had that debate with anyone in their times. They're looking at this through a completely different lens. So in the original context, the debate of the Moses team, 
They're not introducing people to the idea that there was a cosmic flood. They're not saying, hey, guys, I've got some really cool information that you have never heard before. There was a flood. Because if they would have said that to anyone over the age of, I don't know, six years old, the person they said that to would look back at them and say, well, where have you been? <laughs> of course there was a cosmic flood. Everybody knows there was a cosmic flood. Why are you even saying it like that? So their intention was not to introduce the idea that there was this big flood. They're also not trying to prove that the flood happened because everybody already knew that it happened. So it would be like, ah, oh, man. It would be like trying to prove to a, a geologist or, or people who have been raised in the scientific culture in the last 50 years, like saying, hey, I want to prove to you that you know, oil was at one time organic life on, in the world. It was like plants and dinosaurs and stuff. They'd be like, what, what do you mean? This is, I already know that. Everybody already knows that. They're also, what they're doing is, the main thing that the biblical authors are doing, rather than trying to say the flood happened, introducing that idea, or proving that it happened, they are reframing the event that everybody knew already happened. That's what this is about. People already had their stories and ideas about the flood, what it was all about, what happened there, and they're just completely reframing it. So, an analogy. This is a very poor analogy, but thought I would try. So, how many of you have ever heard, grown up in school, or heard about the uh, event that uh, is taught in schools that uh, there was an asteroid that hit the Earth about, I think, 600 million years ago, is that right? And supposedly, and killed off the dinosaurs. Anybody ever heard? Okay. So, anybody going to school is going gonna, is gonna to hear that. And usually, it's, it's usually told in a pretty dry and non-fun narrative way. But if you're like me, when I was growing up, I'm like, oh man, that must have been rough to be a dinosaur. You know? I loved dinosaurs when I was a kid, and I was like, man, that's such a tragedy. Think of that. All these poor dinosaurs are just like doing their dinosaur thing eating other creatures or plants or whatever. And then this giant asteroid hits, and if they don't get killed in the blast, they get killed in the, in the long winter that follows and the plants die off, they have nothing to eat. And that must have been horrifying. So a reframe of that story might be told from the perspective of the mammals. So I'm not saying that the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Scientists will figure out something else that happened and say, oh, we were actually wrong about that in 100 years. Who knows? But just based on the story that everybody's heard, everybody's like got a category for that in your mind. So imagine that there's this family of field mice <laughs> or something like field mice, and they're just hanging out. They know that any day a dinosaur of some kind, big or small, could just eat them up. And so they hide underground and still they lose family members all the time to these dinosaurs. And it's just a world of violence to them. But then one day there was this flash and a shake and the skies turned dark and, and season after season, it's like there was this cold and this darkness. They managed to survive. They had all this, all this food saved up and they could scrap around for other things. And funny, they could move around more freely, you know, because over this period of time of darkness and cold, you know, there was less danger. They weren't getting snapped up and eaten. And so at the end, and the sun finally comes out again, the family of mammals looks around and they see out of the, the ashes and the dry dust and everything, they see little sprouts of green and life. And it's like, whoa, there's new creation has begun, now it's like our time. So I know that's a really terrible analogy. But you see how it reframes the experience. And in a much more profound, Holy Spirit-inspired way, the biblical authors are taking a story that everybody thought they had in their minds 
and they're totally reframing it. So one of the things they're reframing is that the main point of the flood, I mean, there is destruction, obviously, but the main point of the flood is not the flood itself or all the destruction that it wrought, but the rescue of Noah, the rescue. And I love what Dr. Michael Morales says in his book, The Tabernacle Prefigured. He says, while God is the main character of the narrative, Noah, the righteous priest, remember he is the one who makes the offering, may yet be considered the literary hero of the story, who both walks with and brings rest to God. Noah, and there it is in Hebrew, remember you're reading right to left, so there's the, the nun and the chet, so Noah, in fact brings comfort, and reading from right to left again, nun, chet, this time there's a, a mem at the end, so nahum, both to humankind and to God. But further, not only because the narrative begins and ends with God's speech to Noah, and not only because the various word plays on his name indicate Noah as a central character, but because the central question of the narrative concerns salvation and worship. Who may ascend the mountain of Yahweh from Psalm 24, three is really part of the theme of this. The flood narrative is really about Noah. This is to stress that the narrative is not really about the judgment of the world, but about how it was that Noah was saved from that judgment everybody knew about. And he's quoting from John Salehammer here. The purpose of the story is not to show why God sent the flood, but to show why God saved Noah. The ark, not the flood, is the focus of the author's attention. So as a priestly figure who is able to ascend to the mountain of Yahweh, Noah stands as a new Adam, the primordial human who can dwell in the divine presence. As such, he foreshadows the high priest in the tabernacle. This is the tabernacle of Moses. Who alone can enter the paradise of the Holy of Holies to purge the microcosmic tabernacle, the tabernacle is a mini cosmos, by making atonement. So let's look at some of the imagery of the, of the flood. Remember, the Bible is imagistic. So let's see how biblical authors take the images of the flood and apply them to their own Holy Spirit-inspired writing from Isaiah. We're going to come back to Isaiah a few times here. Isaiah 54, verses 9 and 10. And the context here is he's talking to Israel and warning them that because of their sin, the Assyrian Empire, which is just awful, is going to come in and wipe them out. So, verse nine, for this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth or the edits again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my chesed will not be removed from you, nor will my covenant of shalom be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. There's so much here. So he's saying, look, remember the waters of Noah? There was, all, there was, I mean, the mountains were removed and the hills were shaken under this cosmic decreation and the flood that happened. That's what happened. But I said I wouldn't do that to the whole earth again. So I have also sworn I'm, I'm not going to be angry with you, not going to rebuke you, even though judgment comes. <laughs> even though decreation is all around you, my chesed is not going to be removed from you. Chesed is, if you've taken the Ruth class, you, you know this word is not translatable. Um, You'll see it translated favor, grace, mercy, a lot of times, kindness. The King James translators, I love what they did. They just invented a word. They put two words together, loving kindness. It was great. Um, and that's because all of those are true, but none of them completely describes chesed. The best way is to look at how it's acted out. And the story of Ruth is an acting out of chesed. That is how Ruth treats Naomi 
even when Naomi can't do anything for her anymore. Her loyalty to her that is just from her heart, even though they, they don't, you know, they're, relationship was broken because there's no reason for them to be together anymore, even though they're from different people groups, even though Naomi is now going to be a burden to Ruth and she's got to go to this strange land where she could, who knows what could happen to her if she keeps loving Naomi in this way. Well, her, her former mother-in-law from her deceased husband. So this is Ruth's chesed towards Naomi. And this is what God says, I'm going to never removed from you. So mountains might be removed, but not my chesed. The hills might be shaken, but my shalom, my peace, the well-being with you, that wholeness that I bring to you with our relationship is not going to be shaken. And says the Lord who has compassion on you. So here's judgment. Judgment, mountains and hills. Yeah, day of the Lord comes, they're not going to endure. But my chesed, my grace, mercy, loving kindness, and my covenant of shalom, it's going to endure. Jesus in Matthew 24, which is, what, what a chapter, right? Matthew 24. I can't wait to study Matthew 24 with you someday. Starting in verse 35. You know, heaven and earth will pass away. It's happened before but my words will not pass away. So this heaven and earth passing away, this is a cosmic decreation that is coming. It's going to happen in small ways uh, soon and in very big ways in our future. But his words are not going to. He says, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the sun, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man, this is his favorite title for himself, will be just like the days of Noah. And in these, these days he's talking about, as we will see, are the days before Noah got into the ark. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the judgment is that cosmic decreation will come and sweep away humans. But listen, you don't know the day or the hour. So the mercy is if you're alert by heeding his words that never pass away and you live them out, you're going to be ready. You're going to be ready. It's not going to be a disaster for you, just like the days of Noah. Let's see what Peter writes. And Peter uh, was well acquainted with Jesus' interpretation of the Bible. First Peter 3. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, just for unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. That's an interesting line, isn't it? Oh, in case you don't remember who those spirits in prison were, (laughs) who once were disobedience when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. Remember those 120 years? During the construction of the ark? in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So, oh, and corresponding to that, just now that we're on the subject of going through water (laughs) to new creation, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. He's saying so much here. So we'll save the most of it until we can get to 1 Peter in a study sometime. But here's the judgment. Just like the flood, the resurrection of Jesus initiates a proclamation to the disobedient spirits of Noah's day. 
who those disobedient spirits are is a whole thing that we are going to touch on in Jude, okay? So I don't want to spoil it. And there's a subjugation of the cosmic powers we see at the end of that passage. See what Jesus is doing? He's proclaiming to those spirits something, and he's also sub- subjugating all those cosmic, corrupt cosmic powers that thought they knew better than God. And then the mercy is that through this image of the pledge of baptism, which is an image of what happened to Noah and his family in the flood, right? The resurrection flood. This is a a life flood that's going out through all creation now. And it wipes away the authorities of the power. It also saves you. Saves you. All right. Second Peter, where there's more coolness. Chapter two, verse four. For you know, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, I know, a whole bunch of questions, right? But cast them into, and the word in Greek here is tartaros, and I think it's only used a couple of times in the whole New Testament. Usually the word for hell is Hades. This is not that, it's tartaros. And committed them to the pits of, dark, to pits of darkness, held for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah. This is all happening in that time, right? But protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Oh, and if, this is the same thing to Peter. This is like narrative design pattern stuff is coming. Just like the flood, destroyed, uh, ungodly, but you know, also, you know, the, uh, the angels that sinned were cast into Tartarus, but Noah is saved through that. Well, and if he condemned the, sin, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example of what is coming for the ungodly. So this is, again, this is judgment, right? It's not water. It's another type of flood thing that is happening to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not water, it's something else. But remember what he did for Noah in the midst of the destruction? He rescued him. So here we go, verse seven. And if he rescued righteous Lot, same thing as Noah, who was oppressed by the perverted conduct of unscrupulous people, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. He's living in this city and he's tormented by these things. Well, if just like Noah in the flood and just like Lot in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from a trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So he knows. He knows how to take care of this. Here you are undergoing a severe trial for being a believer in Jesus. You know, people are torturing your family members. They're taking people away because that's just, they want to eliminate this Jesus movement. And he's saying, look, just like in the, this terrible time of flood that the unrighteous were held to account, but the righteous were saved, and just like Lot, and for a lot, he had to endure a long time in a place where people were tormenting his soul. Cannot God deliver you? So the judgment is that God brings justice to corrupt angels and the people who collude with them, namely the false teachers that he was talking about in verses one through three that we didn't read. And he does this through floods and water and fire. But the mercy is that he is well able to rescue the righteous when justice comes to the wicked. He's able to do that. So that's the flood being looked at as a judgment, but also mercy. But there's more, there's more. The flood is also a metaphor in the Bible for death and danger that is coming upon you. And of course, rescue. Psalms are really good at this. Psalm 69, and I am skipping so much material related to this. We just kind of, I just had to pick. We only have an hour here. But Psalm 69, psalmist writes, save me, God, for the waters have threatened my life. See what he's doing? I have sunk in deep 
mud. There is no foothold. You see, he's, he's speaking metaphorically here. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. And those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. A lot of people. Those who would destroy me are powerful. Those who oppose me with lies. What I didn't even steal, I then have to restore. So he's being treated with injustice. He's in danger. And the psalmist here compares that to being in floodwaters. And so he needs deliverance, doesn't he? So David's using this image of a flood to describe this danger in his life. Isaiah chapter eight. Well, inasmuch as these people, he's talking about the Israelites here, have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoice in Rezin and the son of Remaliah, it's talking about, this is a way to talk about idolatry and, and allegiances that are not towards God. Verse seven. Now therefore behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the river. You know, the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria is the floodwaters. You see what he's doing? And all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks and it will sweep on into Judah even. It will overflow and pass through it will reach as far as the neck and the spread of its wings will fill the expanse of your land, Emmanuel. So Isaiah is pronouncing this, this doom on the disloyal people of God and this flood that's coming is actually the king of Assyria and his armies. You see what Isaiah is doing here. He's saying this is the pattern of the flood on the unrighteous. So he's using this image of a flood to show this coming danger. All right, one that we've touched on before from the Torah. This is Exodus chapter 14. Israelites have been delivered out of Egypt. There have been 10 strikes, 10 words of God that have uh, decreated the Egyptians for a while. And so they're able to go free now. And they're wandering in the desert or beginning their traveling in the desert towards the promised land. But there's a problem. They come up against this sea and there's an army of Egyptians coming up behind them and they're, they're caught here. They're gonna get slaughtered. So Moses reached out with his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night. This is Genesis, one language of the, the wind of God over the face of the waters, the ruach of God. And turned the sea into dry land. And then the waters were divided. So the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. This is like Noah would have been happy with this, right? Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen went in, this is like their battle tanks went in after them into the midst of the sea. But at the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve. He made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians each said, well, let me flee from Israel for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, reach out with your hand over the sea so the waters may come back over the Egyptians. God didn't have to have Moses do that, right? He could have just done it. You see how God loves to work in partnership by delegating to people since Genesis 1? At any rate, that's extra. So Moses reached out with his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. 
Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and to their left. This is deliverance through the sea, a flood that covered over the enemies. So, so this is Moses here. Remember, he was that child who was rescued in the waters by being in a taba. This is a little Moses callback hyperlink, uh, Noah hyperlink. He brings the Israelites through the sea while it floods the ones who are trying to kill God's people. This, this is, the biblical authors who are writing about this clearly also have the flood of Noah in mind and want us to see the similarities between these events in the way they write about it. Isaiah 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who is your creator, Yaakov, um, another name for Israel, and he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. You know, when you walk through the fire, like this is what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. So the chaos waters that Noah experienced and the consuming fire that Lot and his family escaped from, these are not going to harm the redeemed. These things are not meant for them. They are going to emerge on dry ground like the Tabah did, the ark. They will be engulfed in flame, maybe, but they're not going to burn. Remember that bush at Sinai? It was engulfed in flame, but it didn't burn. Remember Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar? There was fire all around them. They, they were not burning. They were burning, but not scorched, not harmed. So the flood is, so flood danger. But the flood is also a narrative design pattern. And we're just going to hit a couple of these. So remember the flood, Hebrew mabul. It's chaos and disorder, which is a result of illegal attempts to merge heaven and earth. This was the Genesis 6, 1 through 4 stuff, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men, desired them, took them, and the result of that were these Nephilim, who, by the way, what are the Nephilim? They are these Giborim. They're the mighty warriors of old that, you know, are like the founders of all these nations that people talk about, the great ones, the mighty ones. But this was totally unacceptable. It filled the whole earth with violence because these people are violent people. Well, that's one example. Uh, the Tower of Babel, which we're going to get to next week, uh, led with another attempt at merging heaven and earth in a different way, this time from the ground up. It was a flood of confusion that results from that. Sodom and Gomorrah is another example of this. This was a flood of sky fire that came down. So what's this attempt to merge heaven and earth and Sodom and Gomorrah? There's a couple of things that distract us. I know there's one camp over here saying it's all about homosexuality. Well, obviously, there is same-sex stuff going on there, for sure. Another group that says, no, no, it's not about that. It's about inhospitality. Well, there's inhospitality going on there, for sure, no question. But the main narrative point, if you see this design pattern of this, is that the Sodomites were going after angels. You see? Yeah, I know some of you was like, whoa. Yeah, they were going after angels. And so this is, this is you don't cross that boundary. So there's a flood of sky fire that results. The Israelite conquest uh, was another flood. So Joshua leading the Israelites into Canaan, into the land of Canaan, which was to be the promised land, which was the promised land. This was a flood of judgment. 
upon the Canaanites. But wait, the Canaanites, what, what did they do? To, I know that, so when we get to Joshua, we're gonna deal with this in great depth. But I know a lot of people have great, great difficulty, and I understand it, with uh, Joshua and the coming into this land and, and killing people that live there. I, it, I struggle with it. It's, the reason we struggle with it is because we're looking at this through the lens of Jesus. And I think it's good to struggle with that idea. The way that it is presented narratively, I, I just wanna give you a lens that might be helpful to you. And that is to actually read what the Bible says itself. Numbers 13. So the spies had been sent out to scope out the promised land and they come back to report to Moses. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. Oh, dear reader, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. Well, anyway, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. This is a really important clue as to what the biblical authors want us to see as going on here, is this was a judgment upon some sort of violation of the boundaries of heaven and earth that resulted in Nephilim. And that's what was going on in the land of Canaan, just like it happened in the days of Noah. You see? Anyway. I know this is like a, a new way of looking at this. So this is a new flood. Um, now, there is a new flood happening in today, but that was a new flood then as well, where God is gonna institute new creation with a promised land, his called people there by flooding the inhabitants who had somehow violated this boundary again without giving details. Genesis chapter 28. Is there a way to bridge the gap between heaven and earth that is not a violation of the boundary, but is appropriate, is God ordained. It's a good way to do it. Apparently so, Genesis 28. So Yaakov, Jacob, had a dream. And behold, a ladder, I think the better translation is ramp, but a ramp was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. Uh-oh. This is Tower of Babel kind of stuff. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. We don't know if this is a good thing yet. <laughs> this is scary, right? Then behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, oh, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants you know, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So this ramp from heaven somehow is mediating a flood of blessing to the nations through the seed of Jacob. That's how this is supposed to go. That's how heaven and earth are going to be reunited someday, is that there's this coming up and down of angels on this ramp and the voice of the Father speaking and, and through ja some, some seed of Jacob, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed with a flood of blessing. Does this ring any bells? Remember when Jesus told Nathaniel, oh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He's the ramp. He is that thing that connects heaven and earth because he's also the voice from heaven. And through him, all the families of the earth are blessed. He's the means by which heaven and earth will be reunited in a new heavens and a new earth. So John chapter one. Nathaniel answered Jesus. I know I got ahead of myself. Rabbi, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel, because Jesus told them something that only he should know. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Oh, you'll see greater things than these. And he said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is that ramp. So Acts chapter one, and then we, were, we are gonna reflect a little bit. <clears throat> this is when Jesus is with the disciples after his resurrection, and he has not yet ascended into heaven, but this is coming up quick. And the disciples are there, and they're like, okay, this is a big moment. And they're like, and they come together, they began asking him, saying, okay, Lord, is it this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? You know, our expectations have been this, kingdoms coming back to Israel will kick the Romans out. Israel will be like in the times of David, except maybe better. But Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority. Oh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the earth. So there's a new flood, but it's, it's a redemptive anti-flood <laughs> for humans. It's spreading this renewal of something that's even better than Adam's priesthood in the garden. It is a flood of destruction, but it's a flood of destruction for the cosmic powers. You see how they're being flooded out. So here we are, so what is it? Is this the kingdom? The way that the, the New Testament authors looked at this is that we're almost like in this inaugurated but not fulfilled period or uh, already but not yet, as I think some scholars call it. It's already here, but not yet. It's that era of God's kingdom. Jesus is the Taba, he's the ark, inviting the new humanity in, putting the powers on notice that their rule has a fuse on it. It's coming to an end. He's just not gonna contend with them forever. So it's like in the days when Noah was building the ark, the salvation is here. The new creation has been inaugurated. We can see already some of this happening, but the fulfillment is yet to come. And cosmic powers, these corrupt spiritual beings that have rebelled against Yahweh, yeah, your time is, is short. It's not gonna go on forever. Okay, I know that was a lot to digest, but I hope you see at least a little bit how the flood narrative can really help us in how we see other biblical stories and accounts. And let's spend a little bit of time reflecting with the brave folks at our table. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being willing to do this. <laughs> so I did have a takeaway tonight. Thank you. Uh, but first, I loved the analogy about the little cute mice and the big mean dinosaurs. Oh, I was so nervous that one would fall flat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's not my takeaway. My takeaway is really um, about the fact that we all have trials and tribulations. And during those trials and tribulations, it's so easy to focus on the bad. Mm. We might even question God. Why? You know, why is this happening to me? Mm. Um, but Tonight, what I really, what really just boom hit me right upside the head was there's a whole nother side that I don't tend to look at. Again, it's so easy to focus on the bad. Um, is there mercy there? Mm -hmm. uh, is the flood really about the flood? No, it's about Noah being saved. Uh, and so uh, it's really taught me tonight I have to slow down and yes. This is not fun, whatever the trial and tribulation is, but what is God trying to teach me? What mercy is he trying to show to me? Yeah, that's so wise. That's good. Um, I think like one of my big takeaways from all the 
different classes that you've that you've taught is that <clears throat> each book is not um, just independent of itself. I mean, they are just completely intertwined, um, and it's. I think it's quite obvious it's not written by human. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit like has written all of this because um, it's 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 really it's too perfect. I mean, truly, it's it's amazing. It's uh, what is it? Tim Mackey says there's intelligent life here. It's like this isn't just random collection of of stories. They're deeply, fully integrated, and we also know that they. It's not like somebody you know, one person sat down and wrote it all. These are over a long period of time. It's just brilliant. Um, from the writing to the compiling of it, which is, I, I think the people who are involved in that in ancient times that are anonymous, don't, they should get Holy Spirit inspired credit too. This, this thing is amazing. It's amazing. Um, one thing I really noticed is the perspective shift of the flood, mm. seeing it as people coming out, which is um, God rescuing Noah and his family. But that's seen through everywhere else, but seeing that in this story too. Yes. But yes. I did have a question. So on Sodom and Gomorrah, when um, they went after the angels, mm -hmm. or, um, they, that was after God had already appointed Sodom and Gomorrah's end. Yes, correct. And this, them going after the angels was an, the narrator's way of saying, here's what's really going on. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if you look at the timeline, they, they were already appointed for destruction. So violence was covering their land. But that's a little hyperlink that the narrator is putting in there to, to connect it to these other heaven and earth violations. That excellent point. You know, Tim, as um, you were talking tonight, and with all your classes, I would like to look at your classes from the prism of this century. And I tell you, we as a world we as a nation are going through some tumultuous times. And I think the real miracle uh, with what you were talking about tonight, not that the waters were separated, but they went on dry land. That's miraculous that, uh, that the land was completely dry. Yes. You know, for the, for the sole purpose of them to get their, uh, their vehicles through, their animals through, and the, and the humans through. God still does the same thing for us today. We look to the left and the right and we see the tumultuousness about uh, you know, what we're going through as a, as, a, as a nation and as a world. Concentrate on the dry land that God has given us Amen. to walk through. Amen. I'm with you. Thank you all. You guys are awesome. Appreciate you. All right. So are there... There are no questions, so you all have just, that's awesome. You're giving me a, a quick break. So I just want to take this, this time to uh, give you a little bit of my heart for why uh, I've chosen the letter from Jude to be the next one. And, and as far as registration goes, you'll be able to start registering for that. Uh, and again, remember, this is always free. It's just if you want to print one, printed materials, we really could use your help with that. But uh, registration starts next week. It'll be open for online registration. It'll also be open to register here in person. But one of the reasons that the Lord put the letter from Jude on my heart was because Jude is partly meditating on some of the things that we have studied on this class. And he's taking that and he's applying it to a real life situation in the church and I think that it's a great bridge to the next study that we're going to do that I'm not going to announce yet in the fall, uh, which I think you will absolutely love. So I want to encourage you that I don't know of too many people that do an in-depth study on the letter from Jude, uh, these 25 verses. So it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm so excited. I am three weeks in 
already. I'm, I've started working on week four, and I've just got goosebumps. It's just so cool. Uh, so thank you. And I also want to tell you guys, I just love you. Uh, all of us pastors here, Pastor Glenn, Pastor Andrew, we just love you. We love your dedication to God's word, that you're in this class listening to this nerd and, and being so nice to me. Uh, it, it, is, it warms and encourages our hearts to see this passion for the scriptures in our friends and our brothers and sisters. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I just want to thank you for what you're doing here in this place. And I pray, Father, that you would bless every man and woman, every child represented here, and that you would do a, an amazing work of new creation in families that maybe don't know you and friends of ours that don't know you, and that you would begin to work in every heart. Just, Father, separate the waters of chaos in their lives and help us to be a voice uh, that reflects your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.